But how's your heart there, guy? Good. Is your left arm hurt? No. Okay. I'm good. Okay. All right. This Just is going for ratings. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Matrix. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The show is about to begin. Let me tell you why you're here. You're here because you know something. What you know, you can't explain. But you feel it. Good evening and welcome to Three Guys in a Flick. This is where we review the good, the bad, and the absurd. Tonight's episode, The Matrix. Beware, spoilers. Coming to you from my basement, as always, my name is Don. And to my right, we have a heart attack surviving comic book guy, John. Whoa. How are you feeling there, buddy? I'm doing good. Yeah? It's, it's just a little heart attack. All right, cool, cool. That's, uh, that's why we didn't record last week. Yeah. Well, you we, gave me a week off, thanks for that. Well, I didn't want to give you a week off, but... To my left here, the professor, Ken, made me give you a week off, so whatever. Thanks, Ken. I know, Kung Fu. He does. <laughs> well played. Well played. Uh, all right, The Matrix, uh, released on March 31st, 1999. At the time, they uh, the directors were billed as the Wachowski, Wachowski brothers, uh, who are now Lena and Lily Wachowski. Um, they are also credited with writing it. The stars Keanu Reeves, Lawrence Fishburne, Carrie Ann Moss, Hugo Weaving, Gloria Foster, and Joe Pantalonio. Did you know that this movie was originally meant to be a comic book? It was uh, supposed to be inspired by Japanese anime. Uh, I, I know that ja- uh, Japanese anime had a lot to do with the inspiration, uh, specifically like Ghost in the Shell. Uh, major, but I, major influence. But I didn't realize it was... Uh, supposed to be a comic book first yeah they just kept putting more and more into it to the point where it just made more sense to make a movie have you guys seen ghost in the shell Mm -hmm. the the animation Mm -mm. good movie check it out Mm -hmm. it's it's one of the one of the better animes Mm -hmm. there's some great ones out there and that that's one of them nice Mm -hmm. nice nice um i guess that would also kind of explain the animatrix Mm -hmm. i mean because with all of the story that they want to tell ultimately about you know this story uh it makes sense that You know, it's a comic book come to life. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Uh, It was made for $63 million, and it did a box office number of $465.3 million. Not too bad. Not too bad at all, which unfortunately gave us two sequels. Uh, But we can talk about that later. And it gave us a number of bullet time spoofs for what the next two years and almost every movie that you saw. Oh my gosh. From uh, two, uh, from 1999 to probably 2004, every movie had some sort of matrix reference in it. Even Shrek. Yeah. Uh, Princess Fiona doing the Trinity kick. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 This movie at the time in 99, obviously uh, uh, revolutionary uh, changing the game for movies. Won what? Four Academy awards. Four. uh, Sound, best. film editing, uh, special ef- best effects, sound effects, and visual effects. One of my favorite special effects sounds that they used was uh, the sound of the punches. You know what that sounds like right yeah. now in your head? Yeah. Th- that is the sound of a pipe being swung and hitting like a soft pillow or something. Oh, really? That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. When you first saw this movie, yeah. two questions. Did you understand it and did you enjoy it? All good questions. I the first time I saw this movie, I did not see it in the theater. Uh, <gasps> I know back in the nineties, I wasn't uh, the biggest Keanu Reeves fan. Not that you know I have anything against the guy personally. So no, I didn't. I didn't see it in the theater. I saw it uh, one Thanksgiving, and it was halfway through it, and my cousin was uh, explaining me to the story, catching me up, and then I watched the second half up until the end. So I saw half the Matrix. Second time I saw it when it got released on Blu-ray. And I remember thinking, yes, it did make sense. And I thought it was pretty good. Ken, what do you think? 
Uh, I, I fell in love with it immediately upon seeing it in the theater. It was such a phenomenal show, and the uh, special effects, jaw-dropping. Just how did they do that? Oh, my gosh. And the next time it would happen, it's just, that is so cool. Right? I, I was just so captivated. What about you? For me, you know, I saw it in the theater, and this is one of my go-to movies. I love watching this movie specifically because when I realized just how much symbolism and how many hidden Easter eggs there are throughout this entire movie, I just love watching it and discussing it and figuring out a new connection and a new theory. It, it's one of my favorite movies, so I'm glad that we're reviewing it. Now, I do know that for a long time... Uh, the Wachowski brothers had a, had trouble selling people on this film because they the producers and directors they thought it would be too confusing and that people wouldn't get it. I think they did a great job, especially in the way that if you notice, Neo spends the first what forty four minutes of the movie asking something like forty five questions, and that basically that the whole reason why they did that uh, the pr- the producers insisted to answer the questions because they didn't think people would get the movie. Yeah, I thought it was like the first 18 minutes he asks like 40 questions. Something like I that. know it's 40 Crazy. questions, yeah. yeah. At an abandoned hotel within a major city, a woman, later revealed to be Trinity, is cornered by police. With her superhuman abilities, she overpowers them. As she flees, she is pursued by the police and a group of mysterious suited agents capable of similar superhuman feats. She answers a ringing public telephone and vanishes an instant before an agent crashes a truck into the phone booth. So this is the opening of The Matrix. What do you think? So for me, I am in love with this introduction. Opening up a movie is so important. How a director chooses to open up and show us what's going on. So when you have, in particular, like a science fiction movie such as this, it opens in a very different way. Most science fiction movies do not have a cold open like this movie does the star trek franchise they do you know we're just out in space and they're and we don't get caught up on stuff but you look at a ton of other science fiction movies district nine avatar terminator blade runner star wars we all get some sort of an introduction as to where we are and what's going on even the movie alien it has just a little bit we have you know the name of the ship and the cargo and the year right yep. Yep. but matrix cold open and it, it's going to give us, you know, a taste of what it is to come. And that's what I think is just so interesting about how they choose to open this up. Because, you know, when it opens up, you know, we're there with the police. And generally, this is 1999. And, well, pretty much, I think in general, people are kind of sort of, police are considered generally to be the good guys. Mm-hmm. And then you got the men in black showing up. And why? Did, and they're wearing sunglasses at night. What? Oh, okay. But then... Now we go in with the police and we're confronting this woman in black that they're obviously here to arrest. Uh, she's probably a bad guy, right? And then all of a sudden we get even worse news when Agent Smith, when Agent Smith says, you know, uh, we're bringing her down now and Agent Smith, no, Lieutenant, your men are already dead. Okay, clearly she's bad. But then the next thing we see is we get a good shot of her face. You know, we get to see who she is. We get to see those big, pretty eyes. And when we get to see her eyes, now things shift a little bit. And then, oh my gosh, she's, ah, oh, she kills everybody. Mm-hmm. And now things have shifted a little bit. And in a way, we're kind of sort of rooting for her, maybe a little bit, because we feel her anxiety of wanting to get out of there. And, and then as we go shooting, af- as we go after her, we get this great, n- no- you know, film noir look, you know, with long shadows and, and these fantastic frame shots. You know, I, I like in the moment when they're running across the rooftop, there's a couple of shots in there that are straight out of the movie Vertigo, shot for shot on some of those scenes across the rooftop. And so after that happens, she goes tumbling down the stairs and she's like, get up, Trinity, get up, you know. These, these moments, I really feel like that, you know, this chase is its own little story. We meet Trinity, she gets chased, and she gets away. And then we're left with a whole bunch of questions right after. 
you know, the agents are standing there at the rubble, and then as they're standing there at the rubble, and then they have that quick little dialogue, okay, that was the intro, and now we got a whole bunch of questions. Who is Trinity? And why were, were they trying to arrest her? And, and how does she have superpowers? And who's Morpheus? And what about these agents? And why do they have superpowers? And how did she escape the phone booth? And, and what is the Matrix? I don't know any of this stuff. Man, I'm hooked right here. This is a great introduction. Just pulls you right into the movie and you want to see what's going to happen next. You know, it, it sets it up, you know, with there's a taste, you know, of tone and style and action that is delivered in these first couple of minutes of the movie that just pulls you right into the movie. It is a great example of an effective introduction. So, you know, that is great directing there. I don't think Ken liked this movie. <laughs> I'm going to gush all night but long. But <laughs> I got to give Carrie Ann Moss a lot of credit filming this scene. I don't know if you read in some of our little trivia information. She really badly hurt her ankle right at the beginning of filming. And she still went on to film all of these scenes without telling anybody how badly hurt she was because she was afraid of being recast. So I got to give her a lot of credit for that. One of the reasons why I agree with you, I love this intro, is because to me, it's an intro that you can go back and rewatch, and it's it has a little bit of difference every time. Reason being, the first time you watch this, you have, like you said, you have a lot of questions. What the heck is this? How is she doing? How is she jumping across so at such a far distance? You know, how is she taking out all these police officers real quick? Why would she take out policers real quick? You know, is Agent Smith good or bad? You have all those questions. The second time when you know the answer, you then start thinking, wait, there's a bigger mystery here. How did they find her? How did they know? Was she betrayed by somebody? Did somebody give away some information and set her up? so that the police went in and the agents found her. Then it starts to kind of, you know, it almost becomes a different movie the second time you watch, because now it's a mystery, not just a sci-fi. For me, it opens up uh, like a standard science fiction movie. Coming in, we see, you know, the coded Matrix, you know, on screen, and then we hear Trinity and Cypher's voice, and they're having a phone conversation. She mentions, is this line trace, blah, blah, blah. And then we cut into the room and she's on the computer and then we cut outside and we see the police and you know, but as soon as I saw the agents, they scream bad guy, right? Absolutely a hundred percent. And then, you know, I like the, I do like the buildup and I do really like Carrie Ann Moss in this role. Uh, I like the character of Trinity. I think that um, the more I watch it, the more I pick it apart. When I first watched it for, you know, properly, it was a great scene and you're right. It does. It pulls you in. And, and that's so important for a film, right? The, the opening scene, if it pulls you in, it has you for the rest of the time, uh, mark of a great movie. Uh, it pulled me in, but again, watching it the other night and it not being 1999 and knowing what I know, uh, 22 years later. Yeah. There's things that just kind of take me out of it. Ken, you seem to be a Carrie Ann Moss fan. Uh, did you know that they originally wanted Sandra Bullock? To play this character. Yeah, among other characters, you know, that uh, among other actors that they had in mind for uh, the role of Trinity, yeah, there were some other people. They uh, were hoping to originally have Jennifer Beals. And they were also, uh, uh, they also approached Janet Jackson. Mm-hmm. And they also asked for Gillian Anderson. Oh, from the X-Files? Mm-hmm. Really? I did not know that. Mm-hmm. That one I did not know. Yeah. Yeah. I remember uh, Sandra Bullock did an interview originally when it was Will Smith that was supposed to do Neo in this movie. Right. Uh, she, for some reason had something going on or she had had conflicts with Will Smith and she didn't want to do the movie. Then she heard that Keanu Reeves was going to do it and really regretted her choice. Right. Because she wanted to bring back the whole speed pairing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The chemistry that they had on speed. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think that yeah. I don't know if it had worked with, as well with Sandra Bullock in that role. Janet Jackson, maybe. I think Janet Jackson would have been interesting. I, I do, too. As soon as I heard that Janet Jackson uh, was mm-hmm. uh, up for the role, I was thinking, hmm, that could have been cool. Sandra Bullock, I think, I don't know, at the time, maybe. Who knows? Uh, mm-hmm. She didn't really, I mean, she's always been a star, and I personally think she's gotten better over the years as an actress, mm-hmm. but I didn't think she was all that great in Speed. Yeah. And then Speed to Cruise Control, I thought they just completely... <sighs> destroyed Sandra Bullock in that. So. Didn't even watch that movie. Didn't even give it time. Don't need to. Good. You shouldn't. Now, 
There is a movie that this movie, or there's another movie that this movie is often compared to called Dark City. And there's a, a little bit of misinformation out there that people think that Matrix stole from the movie Dark City. Dark City, the script was actually written after Matrix script was written, but was filmed before the Matrix and released before the Matrix. Correct. An interesting note, just to make, you were talking about her running across the top of the rooftops. Did you know that that was the actual sets used from Dark City? I did read that. So there is connections to these two movies, and I don't know why. I mean, there are a lot of similarities, and I think both movies kind of complement each other, but I don't know why people think that Matrix stole from Dark City. Well, because people like to make shit up and start controversy. I think that uh, The Matrix was an original idea from the uh, Wachowski siblings. And, uh, you know, they executed as best they could. And it worked. Mm -hmm. And I'll go on record saying this right now. The Matrix works as a standalone film. Absolutely. In my opinion. But, you know, we can get to that later. Actors that were offered the role of Neo, Leonardo DiCaprio, David Duchovny, Ewan McGregor, Johnny Depp, Val Kilmer, Brad Pitt, and Will Smith. Now, there were two other actors that I want to talk about that they had wished for, but it didn't, they couldn't make it happen. Nicolas Cage and David Schwimmer. I had heard the David Schwimmer thing, and... That would have just been horrible. <laughs> there's one other there's one other one that they wished for, but unfortunately it didn't work out. Back in nineteen ninety four, they had their hopes set on Brandon Lee. Yeah, I could see that. Uh I think out of all of those actors, that would be the only one I could see uh replacing Keanu. Absolutely. Because you know, what'd you say, twenty one years later or twenty however? Twenty two. Twenty two years later. You will all you will always associate Neo as Keanu Reeves, mm-hmm. and wow. you know that cemented Keanu Reeves really and mm-hmm. opened the doors for a lot of things. John Wick. I just would not want to see Neo, you know, doing his bullet time thing, yelling "Unagi." That's Ross from Friends. It's a Friends reference. Oh, uh, actors offered the role of Morpheus, Russell Crowe, and Chow Yun Fat. I thought about Russell Crowe. I also heard. Um, nope. What was his name? Uh, Whiplash from Iron Man 2. Mickey Rourke. Mickey Rourke was also offered or approached to play Morpheus. Can you imagine Mickey Rourke? No, because, uh, again, Larry Fishburne, I think, he's my my favorite character in this film, Mm -hmm. Morpheus. He made the movie, I think. Uh, Absolutely. And Larry Fishburne is so cool. Right? Mm-hmm. And Morpheus was fucking cool. Mm-hmm. I would love to have a pair of those sunglasses. So two other actors that they wished for for Morpheus, Gary Oldman, Samuel Jackson. I heard about Samuel Jackson. That could have been interesting. But for me, I didn't really even know who Lawrence Fishburne really was. I never really paid much attention to him before this movie. I just saw him you know, in other movies and little parts here and there, but never really. After this, I was a Lawrence Fishburne fan. Computer programmer Thomas Anderson, known in the hacking community as Neo, feels something is wrong with the world and is puzzled by repeated online encounters with the phrase, The Matrix. Trinity contacts him and tells him a man named Morpheus has all the answers. A team of agents and police led by Agent Smith arrive at Neo's workplace searching for him. Despite Morpheus' attempt to guide Neo to safety via cell phone, Neo is captured and coerced into helping the agents locate Morpheus, whom they regard as known terrorist. Later, Neo meets Morpheus, who offers him a choice between two pills, red to reveal the truth about the Matrix, and blue to return him to his former life. After Neo swallows the red pill, his reality falls apart and he awakens naked in a slime-filled pod, his muscles atrophied and weakened among countless others attached to an elaborate electrical system. He is retrieved and brought aboard Morpheus's flying ship, the Nebuchadnezzar. What did you guys think of the ship, the Nebuchadnezzar? I liked it. I thought it was pretty cool. I totally dug that ship. That's, that ship has a style um, in the uh, movie world known as cyberpunk. Are you guys familiar, familiar with cyberpunk? Oh, yeah. And so it, it, it's that look of um it's a subgenre of science fiction where you have a dystopian futuristic setting that tends to focus on a combination of low life and high tech and so to see um 
all of the guts of the ship and to see all of the dilapidated state of all of the equipment. And yes, there is technology, but I, I just really enjoyed being able to uh, look at the background of things. So yes, the story is unfolding between the characters, but in a way I felt like the Nebuchadnezzar was another indirect uh, character that was always enjoyable to look at on screen. Oh, I think so. I think if the ship is uh, pleasing to look at, a la Millennium Falcon, uh, it, it, it does add uh, another character, and for sure this one does as well. So, Neo, uh, we are led to believe that we're in the real world as the audience, and Neo's asleep at his computer, and he's looking for Morpheus, and the computer tells him to wake up, and then we find out that Thomas Anderson is doing a backroom deal for some software or something, and people come to his door, and he gets paid for it. Uh, and then the computer tells Neo to follow the White Rabbit, which is one of many Alice in Wonderland references in this film. Uh, so he answers the door, he does the deal, and he notices on the back of uh, the gal a white rabbit. So he goes with them to the club, and this is where he meets Trinity. Trinity was the one that sent him the messages on the computer. I thought that was Morpheus. Uh, he said to Trinity at the club, you were the one on my computer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And she yeah. goes, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I always, I kind of took that too, you know, because he's, you know, um, so they have their meeting at the club and then doesn't he wake up or do we cut to him at work? I think we cut to him at work. So as the audience, we're still kind of thinking that this is the real world, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. We're also getting the reference of, you know, he's constantly falling asleep. It's, you know, he's either waking up in the beginning or he's falling asleep here. He's not active in the real world. We don't know what's going on. Right. Right. And so he sits in a cubicle and he gets a FedEx package. Uh, and it's one of those cool Nokia phones that I think back in 1999, everybody wanted to have. Totally. Uh, I worked at Verizon at the time, uh-huh. Verizon wireless. We actually had a phone called the matrix phone. That's awesome. Did you think his boss was a little bit like a, um, a waking life agent Smith? That's what he, apparently that's how he was designed. He was supposed to be, a human version, uh, scaled down of Agent Smith. Don't you love that? Don't you love that moment in the movie when the phone rings instantly after falling into his hand? Whoa, that was freaky. Yeah, yeah. I, I loved that moment. And it, then I, I I did like how Morpheus was trying to get him out of there, and you know, again with the questions, uh, Thomas Anderson's like, "Who is this? What's going on?" And he's like, "All I can show you is a way out. Stand up. Look, there's." Stand up slowly yeah. toward the elevator. Holy shit. Yes. And, and <laughs> well done. And so going back and watching it again, that's a really poor film scene. How do they not see tall ass Keanu crouching I don't around? No. And as soon as he's especially as for soon as, computer programs who are designed to spot things. What's that? Well, Agent Smith and them are computer programs that are designed to catch people like Neo. To catch Thomas Anderson, and they can't spot him. They don't see the whole room. Right, yeah. And so I thought, you know, that was a little hokey. Uh, I did like when he got to the window, and Morpheus is telling him to, you know, go out there. And then finally, (laughs) Neo can't do it. And so we get to the interrogation scene, and, you know, knowing what we know now, watching uh, the film the other night, uh, the first shot we see of Neo sitting in the interrogation room is... Uh, revealed to be a bunch of monitors and we're kind of zooming in, which I think uh, is a nod to what was coming up in Reloaded about the architect. Uh, so you, we get into a uh, regular interrogation scene. What would you guys think of the whole, you know, the way that played out in real life or what is supposed to be real life? They had a file on them for breaking every computer law the government had and they want to cut a deal with them. Uh you know, what do you think? It seems that you've been living two lives. In one life, you're Thomas A. Anderson, computer programmer for a respectable software company. You have a social security number, you pay your taxes, and you help your landlady carry out her garbage. 
The other has lived in the virtual world of computers where you, go by, where you go by the hacker alias of Neo and are guilty of virtually every computer crime that we have a law for. One of these lives has a future. The other does not. So I got to ask you, Ken, how many times have you seen this movie? A lot. <laughs> I love it. We, we're just going to sit back and let Ken recite the entire movie for your listening pleasure. I'm gushing. Yes, yes, you act are. out the movie? Yeah, something like that. Um, did you think it was kind of weird when they sewed his mouth shut? Well, I thought the great thing about this is we still don't know quite what the Matrix is at this point. First time you're watching it. You don't know that he's not already in the real world. So when that first time, when make, you know, we thought it was great, he's standing up to authority, gives him the middle finger... And you're thinking, great, he wants his one phone call. What's Agent Smith going to do now? You know he's going to do something badass, but you don't know what he's going to do. And all says, how are you going to make your phone call when you can't speak? Yeah, and then his his mouth uh, grows together. And, you know, at the time, pretty cool. Watching it the other night, that particular effect really doesn't hold up. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of mm -hmm. found myself chuckling. Mm -hmm. uh, I did like the idea of the tracker that they put into him. I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, and then he wakes up. Grabs his stomach. Ugh. Right, thinking it was a dream or Again. relieved, relieved that it was a dream. Yeah. Again, yeah. another one of the symbolism of the waking, you know, he's waking up again in this dream. Uh, so he wakes up and the phone rings and this time it is Morpheus. And he says, do you still want to meet? Even though Morpheus knows he's being tracked and uh, he, Morpheus knows what's going on, right? Because he's in the real world. Uh, so they meet under a bridge. Uh, he gets in because he sees Trinity and we meet Switch and Apoc, two of uh, Morpheus's crew from the Nebuchadnezzar. Did you like how Switch called him Copper Top? Yeah, yeah. Which yeah. is obviously a you know a nickname uh, related to a Duracell battery, right? Because that's what the human race has become: mm -hmm. batteries. So the Wachowskis they uh, had that rainfall very well lit for the specific intention of having. The rain coming down the car windows to simulate the matrix code that we see on the computer screens. Yep. Mm -hmm. I've mm -hmm. heard too that if you actually zoom in on the rain, even on the windows, close enough, you can see some of the code in the rain. All right. Quick trivia time. Do not look at your papers in case you have it. Uh, how was the code for the matrix created? I don't remember. Basically, it was. From, I don't remember who exactly specifically, but his wife oh, that, had a that cookbook yeah. that I believe was was a Japanese cookbook. I think it was sushi. Yeah. yeah. And sushi. what they did is they took it and they took the kanji and everything that was in it and reversed it. They reversed it. Yeah. And so they took that and they took other letter or other numbers and notes and uh, just, just reversed them. Yep. Just made them backwards. Yeah. Well done, John. Well done. Yeah. They're in the car. They find out that Neo, they find the tracker inside a Neo's stomach. They take it out and then they take him uh, before Morpheus. So this is our red pill, blue pill moment. So Morpheus kind of tells him, you know, all I'm offering you is the truth. What you do with it is up to you. But if you take this uh, green pill or... <laughs> If you take this red pill, you'll wake up in the real world. And if you take this blue pill, you'll go right back to sleep. What What would the green pill do? You know what? Uh, I'm not even sure. But if there was an option for a green pill, I think I'd take that. Now, I think it, it's okay. good for two hours. <laughs> but if it lasts <laughs> They four lied hours, to me. I thought it was four hours. If it lasts four hours, see a doctor. But uh, I love that uh, the siblings... You know, again, with the symbolism and the thought that they put into this movie on different elements, that they named this character Morpheus. His job appears to be in this movie, not only just finding the one, but he wakes people up in this movie. He goes and finds people and wakes them up. Morpheus, in mythology and in the comic books and all that, is the aspect of dreams. He's the god of dreaming. And he's all about sleep. So you think per character with the name Morpheus would be putting people to sleep, not waking them up. So it's kind of interesting that they chose that specific name. I would have named him Ralph. You named him Ralph? Yeah. With names like Switch, Apoc, Cypher, Trinity, Neo, Tank. I would, uh, Dozer. I would have named him Ralph. 
Not like meth or something. <laughs> meth. No, that would have been something to crack you up. I get. Ma- I get mouse. I get mouse. Why they named a mouse? Because yeah. he's a little guy. Do you know why Ken they named uh, that one character Switch? Indeed, I do. Well, let's hear it. The original intention was that it was going to be one gender in the real world and an an opposite gender in the Matrix world. Yep. Here's a interesting little tidbit. Are either one of you familiar with uh, Michael Hutchins, mm-hmm. the lead singer of, of the NXS? Yes. NXS, yep. unfortunately not with us anymore. Unfortunately not with us anymore. Were you aware that he was cast for a major role in this movie? Mm-hmm. Which role? It doesn't say, but it's got to be for this character. Switch? Yeah. Maybe. It was either Switch or APOC. Maybe. Yeah, unfortunately, um, three days after accepting the role, he had committed suicide. Yeah. So I am thinking that it was probably for the character of Switch. Yeah. Now, kind of what you're touching on about the two genders, uh, from what I've read, you know, the Wachowski siblings were going through some identity issues at the time, and they were looking into transitioning, and they wanted to make a movie that had some elements of transition in it, and that's one of the reasons why they wanted to have this one character that would be, you know, male in the real world, female in the Matrix, or vice versa. I can't remember which one. But they wanted that to basically say that in the Matrix, in the real world, you are who you are, but in the Matrix, you are whoever you want to be. Well, and that's how they're briefly explained about their physical appearance and their clothing and such. Yeah. I kind of wish they would have left that in, but I guess it was too controversial at the time. Well, yeah. And I've always said that... uh, when I taught filmmaking, if you're going to make a film, have something to say, mm-hmm. right? And so the Wachowski siblings obviously had something to say. It came out, and, um, you know, the rest is history. Speaking of appearances, did you hear about how the characters have the sunglasses that they have? I know they were custom made. More to the point, protagonists in the storyline have oval-shaped sunglasses. Antagonists in the story have rectangular-shaped sunglasses. Did you notice in the scene where Morpheus is offering him the pills, in Morpheus's reflections, only one of the Neos reaches out and grabs the pill? Totally cool. Apparently, that's in various places throughout the movie, because I guess I read that the reflection in the sunglasses were supposed to represent choice because in one scene, there's a scene where I believe uh, someone's pointing a gun. I think it's a, uh, I think it's agent Smith. Agent Smith is pointing a gun. Is it in the construct when they go to the, they see the, yes, red when they see the woman in red, agent yes. Smith is pointing the gun at Neo's head. And then in the other reflection, there is no gun. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's supposed to represent choices in the reflections. Speaking of choice, John, Would you take the red pill or the blue pill? That's a tough call because you're really talking, is it better to know or not know? And in this case, you know, Cypher, he puts it in a great little speech that he has later on. He'd rather not know. He'd rather eat the beautiful steak than the the white mush. He'd rather be an actor and not just some guy who wakes up every day on a ship where he has, you know, he's in love with a woman who doesn't give a crap about him things like that so in my case i think i'd rather know i i'd rather know what's going on and be in the real world and kind of join that battle be able to go in and out Hmm. so the caveat is if you take the red pill you have to become a freedom fighter yeah right because it's the uh, machines against the humans but age old tale i think i go back and forth because sometimes maybe it's better not knowing you might be happy well which is it john would you take the red or blue pill i, I, I don't care that. that you just had a heart attack buddy i need you to answer the question i'm gonna take the red pill all right i like what it. about you don uh hang on ken would you take the blue pill or the red pill blue pill you want to go back to sleep yes please yeah and it makes sense right do you really want to become a freedom fighter uh it seems like a lot of responsibility So to answer the question, red pill or blue pill for me, I get why you would want to go back to sleep. I get why you would want to stay in the matrix and continue with life as what you perceive as normal. 
Uh, because being a freedom fighter or fighting for the human race, that's a big responsibility. Now, that being said, with everything that they can do in the Matrix, everything that happens, all the programs that they can upload. I mean, you could basically be a person with abilities. I think if I could fly and if I could have the fighting style and just be a badass like Neo, I think I'd fucking do it. I think I'd take the red pill. Here's the thing I was thinking about last time I watched this movie is most of the people who've been awakened were looking to find out the secret of the matrix. They weren't content with life. They bring up with Thomas Anderson that he's searching and he's been down these same roads before and he's not happy with his current life because he wants to know what else is out there, what's really going on and what the secrets are. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking in this case, if you're happy with your life, you'd probably want to take the blue pill. If you're not happy at all, you think something's seriously missing, you'd want to take that adventure and take the red pill. I thought it was interesting. In an interview, the Wachowski uh, siblings decided that they would have taken the blue pill. I found that interesting that the writers of this script would want to keep in the dark. Yeah. Interesting stuff. Okay. Yeah. So after Neo takes the red pill, it turns out that it's a tracker and it needs to find him in the real world. And this is our uh, kind of our second glimpse. Uh, Morpheus kind of showed him what the outside world looked like. You know, we see him in a pod. We see that the machine squid looking thing comes down, unplugs him. Scary as shit. Well, yeah, you know, you know really what's is. funny is to me, this was pure comedy. And I'll give you a reason why. What that pill did not only was a tracker. The pill simulated that he was dead. That's why the big machine came up and basically flushed him like you would flush a dead goldfish down a toilet. Yeah. So to me, that just was, it makes me laugh every time I see it thinking he's being flushed down the toilet. Because that's what we were to the machines. Yeah, we're like yeah. goldfish with yeah. energy. <laughs> so that's why you say it's scary. To me, first time, absolutely scary. Every time after that thinking, he's just a dead goldfish. And he gets flushed into a giant sewer. Yeah. Uh, did you know that Keanu Reeves uh, lost 15 pounds, shaved all the hair off his body, and they shot this scene last? Mm -hmm. They shot everything uh, before that so he could be all buff and in shape and do his kicks and whatnot. But they shot this laugh, uh, last, and, you know, it works. He wakes up. It's discombobulating. It's, I'm sure, terrifying. Uh, th those those tubes that go into the skin and in the back of the head, that always kind of creeped me out. You know, because that's what they were, mm -hmm. uh, that's what was happening. So, yeah, they flush him. The Nebuchadnezzar picks him up, and he is now in the real world. Yep. Using muscles and using, um, you know, his eyes and things that he's never actually ever used in his life. Yeah. There's a great scene uh, where Neo asks Morpheus, why do my eyes hurt? And the look on Morpheus's face is just pure sadness and maybe dread but he says because you've never used them before and you, you're just like oh well that was a good piece of writing i like that mm -hmm. as neil recuperates from a lifetime of physical inactivity from the pod morpheus explains the truth in the early 21st century there was a war between humans and intelligent machines when humans blocked the machines access to solar energy the machines harvested the humans bioelectric power keeping them pacified in the matrix a shared simulated reality molded after the world as it existed at the end of the 20th century. The machines have taken over the world. The city of Zion is the last refuge for free humans. Morpheus and his crew are a group of rebels who hack into the Matrix to unplug enslaved humans and recruit them. Their understanding of the Matrix simulated nature enables them to bend its physical laws. Morpheus warns Neo that death within the Matrix kills the physical body, and the agents he met are powerful, sentient computer programs that eliminate threats to the system. While machines called Sentinels destroy rebels in the real world, Neo's prowess during virtual combat training lends credibility to Morpheus's belief that Neo is the one, an especially powerful human prophesized to free humanity and end the war. At this point, are you noticing... Uh, the use of colors in this movie in that everything in the matrix has a greenish tint. Everything in the real world has a bluish tint. And when they're in the construct doing the training that has a yellowish tint. 
this is the first time that we've seen the real world, mm-hmm. right? So you notice the color change automatically. It, it makes sense that, you know, they would use color to uh, differentiate where we're at uh, on screen. The construct I thought was pretty cool. Uh, I love the training montage. I think that one of my favorite scenes is I like the character of Tank. Mm -hmm. Uh, he was very uh, enthusiastic and super excited about Neo being there. And so, I mean, Neo's supposed to be the one and he's supposed to be, you know, the savior, the, the Christ figure, if you will. But that scene where tank hooks him up to the matrix, uh, and, or to the construct, excuse me. And he loads, he gives him some information like Kung Fu or combat training and it hits Neo and he comes back and tank says, do you want some more? And Neo's like, hell yes. I mean, I thought that was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Where did they get the programs from? They're hackers. That's what I was thinking. They must've ripped them off from the the matrix. I thought it was interesting. Again, clever use of words, clever use of scripting. But when Morpheus comes in to check on Neo's progress, uh, Tank reveals he's been at it for 10 hours. This guy is some kind of machine. Yeah. Again, just the clever wording, the clever. Yeah, but you don't know any of this the first time you see it. Mm-hmm. You know, going back to uh, going back in and watching it again, you, you pick up on these things. Yeah. Speaking of clever wording, did you happen to notice that it's got to be at least a half dozen times in the movie that the uh, phrase... Jesus, Jesus Christ. Oh, yeah, that's throughout the movie. Yeah, it, it, it's throughout the movie. I mean, that obviously brings up the religious symbolism, Neo, anagram for one. Thomas Anderson, I believe the name Anderson, is uh, translates into son of man. You got Trinity, you got, I mean, just a ton of religious references throughout this whole thing. Yeah. So the uh, Big Lebowski had how many fucks? 290? Something like that. Crazy. How many fucks were in the Matrix? I don't know. Ken, do you got that? Zero. Hmm. So they didn't give a fuck? They chose to go with shit. That was uttered 32 times. Well, there you go. And and so their thought was to supplant F-bombs with J-bombs. What about, whoa, do we have a count on that? Uh, once I think, okay. which is good for Keanu, yeah. right? <laughs> um, so yeah, they, they spend a lot of time uh, healing Neo's body cause he's never used it. And then he finally gets jacked into the construct with the training. And then, I mean, the whole point of Morpheus finding Neo was because he thinks he's the one, the one prophesized to bring balance to the force. And, um, you know, the next step is to go see Yoda. I'm sorry, wrong fucking movie. The Oracle. Uh, The group enters the Matrix to visit the Oracle, the prophet who predicted the emergence of the one. She suggests to Neo that he is not the one and warns that he will have to choose between Morpheus's life and his own. The group is ambushed by agents and tactical police tipped off by Cypher, a disgruntled crew member who betrays Morpheus in exchange for a comfortable life in the Matrix. Morpheus allows himself to be captured so the rest of the crew can escape. Cypher exits the Matrix first and murders several crew members as they lie defenseless in the real world. Before he can kill Neo, Cypher is killed by Tank, a crewman who he previously wounded. So this whole visit to the Oracle thing, what do you think? You know, this actually brought up an interesting dilemma for me. Morpheus kind of promised Neo and everyone else that they they free them from the Matrix. You're, You're getting this freedom... That if you come into the real world and become this freedom fighter, and if he becomes the one, he'll be free. Yet, did Neo really even have a choice? When he woke up, he's immediately becoming a freedom fighter. He has to go to the Oracle who will put him on the path. You know, the direction that he has to head. Is there any freedom in this movie? People are basically being yes, told yes. what they're going to do. Yes, there is. Because there is always choice. But do they ever really make their own choice? Yes. Except for Cypher. No, no, they, oh, no, no. no. We'll, we'll, no. Yeah, of course they do. Okay, okay, so tacking on to this scene, uh, the Oracle tells him, you know, you're not the one. You're not the one. And at that given moment, he wasn't. That's exactly right. And, and then she couldn't make him 
do it because then he would have been predestined into it. And that is not what the one is supposed to be. The one has to be the one that he, that they decide to do it. It is their choice to step forward, not because somebody else told them to. And that's why the Oracle says no. Right. But like Morpheus, he was told that his whole purpose was to find the one. He was, And he fulfilled his purpose according to that direction. I'm, sh- I'm sure Morpheus was given a choice. You can be freed and find the one, or you can stay here. Still a choice. It seems like they're all still taking their marching orders. Everyone that's given a choice, except for Cypher, who decides to rebel against whatever. Well, that was his choice. His choice that was to... He, so Trinity was told to fall in love? Yeah, she was told you will fall in love. No, she said, that, you, and, she said you will love the one who is the one. Or you will fall in love and that one, or that person will be the one. She, so she was told she will fall in love with the one. I didn't interpret it that way. Oh. She just said that she would love who the one was. We don't know what type of love that was. Oh. You know, but, you know, and they had to work in a, a love story element, which I didn't hate. I, I thought it was fine. I thought the chemistry between Carrie Ann Moss and uh, Keanu worked for them mm-hmm. and in this movie. Not trying to bring in the sequels. Cause I know you're a huge fan of the sequels. Don't yes, you? I am. Do you feel the Oracle was on the side of the humans? Or as we find out later in the future movies, she's just another software program. Do you think she was just running her program? I think that through the artificial intelligence, uh, since we are in a world that we are in machines and we're batteries and we're this far gone already, I like to think that the Oracle uh, knew love. And I think ultimately at the end of the day, love wins at the end of the story. So what do you think, Ken? Do you think Oracle good, bad, just running her own program? I thought the Oracle in general as benevolent and wanting good intentions. And it is not only about the order and the, uh, and the propagating and the promoting of the machines. The the reason why I asked that, and I don't know if you realize this, in the second movie, we're introduced to the character of the architect. The architect is the person who designed and created the Matrix, and every iteration that they've talked about, he keeps redesigning a new Matrix and just runs it. I see the Oracle as the control factor. She's the one who introduces something different with each iteration, a different choice or a different option that changes something in the matrix, what her purpose is, whether she's trying to seek peace between the humans, and the machines, or she's just fulfilling her purpose to introduce that change. Uh, every time the matrix runs through, she doesn't really know the future. She knows the past because she's seen what's happened with every iteration. So each time she says something different to each of the people who approach her that changes some element in the matrix to create a whole different outcome. She, again, I feel like it's a big controlled experiment and she's just the one introducing the random factor. That is certainly an interesting way of looking at it. She, and she might be uh, a control factor, but I like to think that th- there's two sides to every coin and we've met the Oracle and you, agent Smith is the baddie of this film, but uh, inevitably uh, we'll always have someone who's, worse or more of the antagonist and that would be the architect and the uh, other films so i mean you have to have a balance Mm -hmm. right everything's a balance good versus evil right versus wrong this that or the other i think the oracle has earned the trust of the humans and i think that the humans take what she gives them it's like morpheus said to neo after his visit he says what she told you was for you and you alone Mm-hmm. right uh, she told you exactly what you needed to hear and right because she asks him she goes do you think you're the one and he goes i don't think so i don't know or something and she goes well good because you're not mm-hmm. at that moment in time no he wasn't because right? he chose not to step up and no way and no way for one moment as an audience member did i think he was not the one i mean he's billed he's on the fucking poster Right. You know, he's going to be the hero. So I thought this was the Oracle giving him a choice. My, my thought again, going back and rewatching it, rewatching it, not the first time I saw it was that 
maybe she told the last Neo that came to her, you are the one, and it had a completely different outcome. Sure, I So this see time that. she's telling him, you're not the one, and let's see what happens. It's like everybody, all these humans, all these real people are just lab rats to her. So what you're saying is the artificial intelligence learned it's learning each time that they do it. That's what the architect explains. So, nev- or so, what I kind of hear you saying is that when the machines take over, we're all fucked. Well, right? that that's a whole other thing I want to talk about in a bit. Okay, sounds good. I, I do want to mention that one moment in the movie when Neo comes out to Cipher, and uh, he's looking at Cipher just dinking around, and Jesus, you scared me. And then right after that. Cypher shuts down a whole bank of computer monitors and then they have their talk and then blah, blah, blah. The next scene, what's the next scene right after that? Is it Cypher at dinner with Agent Smith? Cypher eating dinner. I sort of feel like that Cypher was having a communication with the machines and Neil walked in on it. Oh, absolutely. And, And going back and looking at it again, that opening, he's setting Trinity up. Yep. So Cypher yep. is, you know, a traitor and rectangular but, sunglasses. And, and I want to give an award. Ooh, nice call. I want to give an award for the best damn looking steak I've ever seen in a movie. That makes me hungry every freaking time. And the fact that, yes, I just had a heart attack last week and I'm trying to cut that stuff out of my diet. It looks gorgeous. Oh, that's difficult seeing that steak. It looks so Decadent. <laughs> that, that to me is the new villain of the movie. Have you ever seen Law Biting a Citizen with Jamie Foxx and Gerard Butler? No, I have not. So a friend of mine uh, absolutely loves this movie and she will watch it every day, all day. And there is a scene where they go to Delfino's, I think is the name of the restaurant in New York, and he gets a T-bone. That is on par with the steak from The Matrix. That steak looks so good. Good. In fact, when, when when we were in New York, we went to that restaurant. We didn't go in or anything because it's super bougie. But, you know, I think that that steak, I think uh, the law-abiding a citizen steak gives the Matrix steak a run for its money. Interesting, Ken, that you bring up Cypher with the agents. Did you catch all of the uh, little hidden trivia that they revealed during that interaction? Like what they revealed his real name is, his real last name. Uh, he says his, his last name is Reagan, oh, like yeah, yeah, President yeah, yeah, Reagan. Yeah. yeah, He wants to forget everything, mm-hmm. kind of like President Reagan. He wants to be an actor, President Reagan. So they're kind of, it's almost like, do you feel like they kind of put that in yeah, there Yeah, but at the time, had Reagan really forgotten everything in 99? I don't know. He didn't pass away until... Later, awful mm-hmm. lot of coincidences in there. Well, no, I think it was a, de- I think it was a definite uh, reference to President Reagan. You know, he wanted to be someone important, like an actor. Certainly, mm-hmm. yeah, certainly. So they're done with their visit from the Oracle. The agents have found him because Cipher uh, turned him in. He's a and dick because so, he's a dick, and he's running. They're running for their lives because Morpheus once said, or was it Trinity? When you see an agent, you run. So they start to run. But before that, the Oracle tells Neo, yes, you're not the one. But she also tells him, you are going to have to make a choice. Your life or Morpheus's life. And then she gives him a cookie, which is ironic. Thank you. So the agents are chasing our heroes. And they come to a point where they're going to capture Neo. But Morpheus, believing Neo is the one, sacrifices himself and jumps out of the wall and attacks Agent Smith. Uh, Neo obviously wants to help him, but Trinity's like, no, he's doing this for you. Leave so they can escape and Neo and Morpheus gets captured. Um, I do like the setup of this whole thing in that when they first get there, Cypher takes out his phone and drops it in the trash can so the agents can track him. That's how they found him. Right. I was taken back at mouse's death i felt so bad to see him get killed i mean this is and it was quick yeah it was just a quick but he had one of the badass most badass guns yeah in the whole thing for such a small guy yeah he did uh such a nice guy too and brought up some great points you know why does everything taste like chicken i did like that scene i did like the fight scene between morpheus and agent smith but i expected 
Morpheus to put up a more of a fight. You know, when I was watching it the other night, it's funny that you say that because I kind of did too. Uh, he seems to be like such a badass and they made it such a big deal on the Nebuchadnezzar when uh, Neo was taking on Morpheus, right? It was like a big event and everyone had to go watch. And yes, he is holding his own for a minute or two, but ultimately Agent Smith gets the better of him. And, you know, for the story's sake, we, he has to get captured. Mm-hmm. Um, How many police officers did it take? A dozen. I counted a dozen. Oh, when they open the door and he says, take them down. Great overhead shot. And then we f- we find out that Cypher is the bad guy and he gets out of the Matrix before everyone else. And there were there were clues all along, even the phone call he has with the operator uh, tank. You know, he, he then, uh, then Trinity calls him and he goes, aren't you with Cypher? And they're like, Cypher, where's Cypher? So anyway, Cypher gets out and then he shoots Tank and Dozer with a... Uh, lightning gun or should, whatever should we just call him judas at this point you can a more religious symbolism yeah. and he gets out because that's what i was thinking when i watched it he even says to uh you know as he's pulling the plugs on apoc and he pulls the plug on switch he says it takes him it'll take a miracle to save neo and here we get a miracle what was the miracle was that tank wasn't really dead he gets up and he shoots cypher he, I knew all of the other ones were going to die. And mm-hmm. right before he gets to Neo, I knew something was going to happen. And though it, it was okay, and I'm glad that Tank didn't die and gave us a reason to get Neo and Trinity out of uh, the Matrix. But I thought that the way he kills Switch and Apoc was so cold-blooded. Mm-hmm. You know, he was just ready to Ruthless. kill them all. And you all. think these were friends of his that he's been on the ship with. Like Absolutely. He, and w- did they ever say how long he had been freed? They did not, but remember during the interview, I mean, I can kind of understand why he was capable of doing it because when he was talking to the agents, he didn't want to remember anything. So he knew, right. I'm going to commit this heinous thing. I'm going to go ahead and kill these people, and I'm not going to remember it. I thought he said to Neo when Neo snuck up on him, I thought Cypher might have said a year. I thought it was three. I thought he said something like, I've been following Morpheus around for three years or yeah, whatever. I, I thought it was during that scene that he mentions how long he's in. Now, I wonder, world. and it's something I've thought about every time I've watched this movie, is, is if some of the people that Morpheus had freed before he freed Neo, he had thought they were the one. Because they had said he had thought previously other people were the one and had been wrong. Yeah. What if he had pulled Cypher out, thinking Cypher was the one, put all that in his head, only to find out he's not the one? That would have been pretty crushing, and I can kind of understand his motives after that. Yeah, but I mean... I don't think that was ever said. I think the way it was portrayed that uh, Cypher was just sick of the bullshit and mm-hmm. he just got tired. And I mean, look at the life. Can you blame the guy that white mush and the way they have to live and, you know, tattered clothes. I yeah. think it was also a big sticking point was he was in love with Trinity. Yeah. Yeah. And no, he makes Trinity that clear. was promised to basically the one. In the Matrix, the agents interrogate Morpheus to learn his access codes to the mainframe computer in Zion. Tank proposes killing Morpheus to prevent this, but Neo resolves to return to the Matrix to rescue Morpheus, as prophesied by the Oracle. While rescuing Morpheus, Neo gains confidence in his abilities, performing feats comparable to the agents. Morpheus and Trinity exit the Matrix, but Smith ambushes and kills Neo before he can leave. As a group of sentinels attack the Nebuchadnezzar, Trinity whispers to Neo that he cannot be dead because she loves him and the Oracle told her she would fall in love with the One. She kisses Neo and he revives with newfound power to perceive and control the Matrix. He effortlessly defeats Smith and leaves the Matrix just in time for the ship's EMP to disable the sentinels. So let's talk about this for a minute. Uh, His Morpheus' interrogation scene, I thought, Uh, That was some of Hugo Weaving's best work. Uh, He is straight up the bad guy. He does not want to be there anymore. And he is such a badass that when he's done being a dick to Morpheus, the other agents walk in and they're like, what did you do? (laughs) Well, here's another piece of trivia. Here's a trivia question for you. Who did Hugo Weaving model Agent Smith off of? Walter Cronkite. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. That very monotone voice. You do it better, Ken. Give me some Agent Smith. I hate this place, this zoo, this prison, this reality, whatever you want to call it. I can't stand it any longer. 
It's the smell, if there's such a thing. I feel saturated by it. And every time I do, I feel I've somehow been infected by it. Very well Fantastic. done, Professor. Good job. Now, an interesting part in that scene, he refers to humans and humankind as a virus, as a parasite. Yet in the future movies, Agent Smith becomes the virus. I love his explanation about that. And it makes sense. I mean, I struggle throughout this whole movie, every time I watch it, really thinking, are the machines the good guys or the bad guys? Are they really the bad guys in this? Well, yes. if, if you're a machine, then no, you're not the bad guy. But think about it, Ken. Uh, the way I see it, the machine, they say in the beginning of the movie, they don't know who started the battle it, or the war. If you watch the Animatrix, which mm -hmm. unfortunately I actually haven't watched, but I've read about it. Uh, if you watch it, you see that it was one hum or one machine that, that I believe acted up against being a slave or trying to save itself, killed a human, that started the war, the humans blotted out the sun to try to take the power away from the machines. The machines ended up winning the war. They could have found other energy sources. They did not need to rely on humans. They could have wiped out every single human. What other energy sources would they have found? They could have come up with a way to clear the sky. They could have put balloons up there past the sky. They could have had solar reflectors. They could have come up with them. And they're machines. They're smart. They know how to figure these things out. They didn't need to save the humans. They actually allowed the humans to live and then kept trying, you know, as they called them, a crop, but kept trying to create this perfect matrix that the human beings could live in and not just plug them in and keep them as docile batteries. So I almost see, you know, they had some good elements to them. They just were unemotional and not caring. Or alive. Or alive. Well, and okay, your so version of a, being alive. A machine versus a human? I'm just saying, you know, what is your definition of being alive? Do they have to have a heartbeat to okay, be alive? So they make their own choices. All right. No, and, and that's a fair point. Is I guess five alive? I guess what I should have said was human being versus a machine. And if you want to think that the machines are not the bad guys of this film, that's your prerogative. That just means that you would hold a machine presence over human beings. I just wonder, and that's fine. I just wonder mostly if the humans hadn't tried to take away the power source or had tried to make peace with the machines. We don't know, obviously, what would have happened. But would that have been a different outcome? Was it the humans that struck so violently against the machines that forced their hand? I think it was the humans because we're arrogant and we have to be in control all the time. And this is our Earth and we didn't know how to play nicely with the machines, a la Terminator. Um, so, you know, but I Skynet think, struck first. Well, because they knew we were assholes. Collectively, people always make terrible decisions. Yeah. Tommy Lee Jones says it best in men in black. Yes. A person is smart, but people as a group are dumb overreacting and they panic. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, whether the machine started it or we started it, I think that when we blotted out the sun, we condemned everybody because mm -hmm. we didn't. Again, human beings being arrogant, they didn't take into consideration that we still need crops. We still need sun. I mean, so it ultimately it backfired on them. Yes. Yeah, so, and this is what we got. So it's really, I, I, I agree with you. It, it's hard to say who's the good, who's the bad. Are they both bad guys? No, it's not hard to say. So you think the, the humans are the good guys? Absolutely, because I am a human being and that's who I uh, reflect with. Okay. And the bad guy is Agent Smith. Now, he's a program. But he is related to the machines, and so the, he is the face of the bad guys. Right. Yeah, but he eventually gets kicked out. Yeah, and that goes into those two worthless sequels that um, we may or may not talk about. That don't have anything to do with what we're talking about right now. Right. So we, uh, this is the point in the film that, you know, I think Tank is ready to let Morpheus go. He's ready to kill him to protect the codes at Zion. But here's my one question. You have flying ships. You're, you can go into a construct, you can go into the matrix, you can fly, you can, you know, stop time or, or bullet dodge shit. You can't change access codes. I thought about that too. That why can't they just fix Zion? Just change the codes. Uh, Windows tells me to change my password every 90 days. Mm -hmm. So good job on that one, Wachowskis. Maybe it was a Windows 7. I would say Vista. 
Oh. <laughs> or Windows 98. Yeah. <laughs> that's even better. No, Vista still takes the cake. Um, so yeah, Tank has to make a choice and he's ready to unplug Morpheus and Neo stops him and says, this is what the Oracle was talking about. This was the whole reason why I went to the Oracle. She said I had to make a choice, either live or let Morpheus die. And he says, I can't explain why, but we can't do this. I'm, I'm going back in and I'm going after him. And Tank and Trinity are like, what the fuck? No, you can't do that. No one's ever done that. And Neo stands his ground and says, yeah, I'm going back in after him. And he says this, all this stuff about what he believes. And then he starts getting ready and Trinity starts to get ready with him. And he looks at Trinity and to protect her because he, he knows he loves her. And we know that she loves him. He's blah, being blah, the man blah. Is what he's being. I suppose. Sure. Or protective. Yeah, but I love what she says to him. I love that he, she listens to everything he has to say. And then she turns around and he says, okay, now let me tell you what I believe. I believe that Morpheus means more to me than he does to you. And I believe that if you're going to pull this off, you are going to need my help. And sure as shit. She also makes sure to point out she's much higher rank. Oh, him. yes. And then she, she, yeah, you're absolutely right. She ends it with, and if I believe if you don't like that, you can go to hell. So, uh, that was good writing too. So they decide to go in, they jack in and, um, Lots of guns. <laughs> One of my favorite lines in this entire film. Uh, Tank says, what do you need? And uh, Guns. Lots of guns. Yeah, good stuff. So now we get to the scene where they go in to rescue Morpheus. They have all the big guns. And this is probably one of the most iconic scenes from uh, The Matrix. Good or bad, whether you like it or don't or whatever, you know, happens, happens. If you've seen The Matrix, you talk about the lobby scene. Right. Right. So my question to you is every time they run out of ammo, they throw the gun away. Why not just reload it? Wouldn't that be less to carry? My thought was, is the whole scene, I think was supposed to only take four minutes. If you actually sped it to real time, it was all in slow motion. So they didn't have time to sit there and reload each time. That was just my original thought. I thought that they should have had more clips. Keep throwing. Look at all those guns. Okay. How about some ammo? No ammo. Just the one clip in the gun. Yeah, and and none of them had aim. Why? I mean, very very few. I mean, they ultimately defeat the bad guys because they have to. There are good guys, uh, but you know the bad guys couldn't hit them either. So well, here, here's my issue with this scene, and I like to think of this as the Death Star contractor issue. <laughs> Basically, you have a lobby full of security guards. Who just went to work in the morning. Just they went to work. They don't know if they're working for good guys, bad guys. They're just doing their job. And we've already been told that each one of those people represents somebody who's plugged into the matrix. Mm -hmm. Each one, if killed, will die in real life. Yep. So basically, just kind of like the Death Star, these are people who were just showing up to work. And in comes this guy, you know, these two people, guy and girl, with guns. Who just wipe everybody out. And so that uh, that leads to a question for me. Uh, the reaction time. So they walk in and the guards had plenty of time to shoot Neo in the head as soon as he opened his... Because, I mean, he posed. Well, it was the surprise. Well, he... If you unrove with me like that, I'm going to shoot you in the head. But I agree with you. It is like the contractor thing. And those guys, I mean, it's just a bad luck. To, I mean, that's just bad luck. Well, they have access to any weapon they want, Correct. Yeah. So why couldn't they throw in some gas grenades and knock everybody out in the lobby? Well, because you don't trust anybody in the Matrix. Morpheus said it yourself. Yeah. You're either with us or you're against us. I love the lobby scene, man. I'll watch it every single time it's on. It's one of the best action scenes out there. In 1999, yes, it was. Today, not so much. What would you say is better today? Action scene? Yeah. At the end of Endgame? Yeah. I think Marvel did it better. So again, for 1999, it was a great action set piece. Uh, it was practical. They put uh, Keanu and Carrie uh, Ann Moss on wires and they flipped them around and cool. But watching it last night or when I watched it, I mean, it looks dated to me, but that's just to me. Mm -hmm. I dug that they spent so much time in training four months that they all spent time in training. That was, that's real dedication to the movie. Uh, John Wick, way better action sequences. Oh, but we'll yeah. get into that later. Uh, I this does have one of my uh, one of one of the scenes that I liked is when they get into the elevator. Ding. Yep, <laughs> and uh, they 
open it up and they get on top, a la Die Hard. And uh, there is no spoon. And he shoots the thing and they fly right up. I thought that was pretty cool. That's a great looking shot. Yeah, mm-hmm. that, that shot is a great looking shot. So they go to the roof, which I don't know what their plan was. Did they know that there was a helicopter up there? I believe so. How? Tank. Tank probably. They can see things in the codes. They can see where things oh, are. Oh, you're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. So they get to the roof and uh, they dispatch the <laughs> contract workers or the workers that were there to go to work. And the they poor got, innocent helicopter. Uh, yeah, and they all die. Although he becomes the agent, right? Yeah. Yeah. The one of the, the, the helicopter. Yeah, the, the helicopter pilot. Pi- pilot does become the agent. You're right. Uh, but all the other ones that they're dispatching are just regular guys. So really, Trinity and Neo are just a bunch of murderers. Yeah. But at this point, this is where we first get to see Neo becoming the one. He starts to move subtly. Like yes, so that's kind of where the hint. You know, how did you move like that? You move like them. I think this one of the lines in this scene just was. I don't know if it was out of place, but it was such a great line when Carrie Ann Moss Trinity put the gun to the agent's head and said, "Dodge this." Well, I want to know is how the agent missed her to begin with. Yeah, it was a big open roof. Where did she hide? And, okay, so she used her special abilities and got real close. I thought it was a great scene. I thought it was a great line. Obviously, the agent's not dead. That helicopter pilot is. So, sorry for going to work that day, buddy. Um, Mm -hmm. But I I liked it. I bought it. It was a good uh, she saves Neo moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was sexy as hell, those camera shots. The wide-angle shot, you know, when she says, dodge this. And then the slow motion of the agent slowly going backwards, the backdrop of the helicopter and Trinity in that big triangle pose with that hand cannon. Just beautifully shot. I was just, that, that's, that's my second favorite moment in the movie. I, I, I love the lobby scene, and I love the rooftop helicopter dodge this moment. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, so they steal the helicopter uh, i like how trinity calls the operator and says tank i need to know how to fly this do you know how to fly this a b212 yeah yeah and so they get in and here's okay so i'm gonna pick this shit apart real quick they're trying to rescue morpheus they are flying in front of the building and the helicopter's going and they pull out this uh, minigun how does neo not shoot morpheus a thousand times i have thought the same thing every time i've seen that scene me too but he is the one yeah not yet he isn't and with all the glass and all the water and everything splashing down he doesn't see it in code yet mm-hmm. right so how does he not shoot morpheus in the head can can i pull a dawn response absolutely because it's written that way and I think at this point, you're just going to have to accept that. Uh, but it does bother me every time I watch it. I'm thinking, he just killed Morpheus, so he contradicted everything he was supposed to be doing. I, I agree with you 100%. I've, every time I've seen this movie, I kept thinking, how did Morpheus not even just get clipped in the shoulder or in the leg? Or Well, he does get clipped in the leg, but it's the agent, finally, the, the, agents, agent. the, the agents finally hit their hit their mark. Did so you good for them. Did you get like, the first or maybe many times after that, Again, going back to when Agent Smith is talking to Morpheus alone and he pulls his earplug out of his ear, yeah. that that's him unplugging from the, from the machine. Yes. Yeah. And that's why he didn't know anything was going on because Correct. he was no longer plugged in. Yeah. So yeah. it's interesting that he had the ability as a software program, as a machine already at that point to unplug himself. Well, they all did. They all had those earpieces. But they all basically were software programs who had to follow specific rules. That's why they couldn't do any of the things that specifically Neo could do. Right. Neo was above them because they had a set of rules they had to follow. And you think the machine would put one rule in there, you can't unplug. Well, the program is artificial intelligence, so maybe it's growing smarter. Yeah. I'm wondering if Agent Smith at this point was already growing smarter. Well, he was talking about wanting to get the hell out of there. Yeah, he he kind of already had emotions and opinions. Yeah. So Neo rescues Trinity as the copter is going down, which I thought was a, a pretty shot. Uh, he uh, he gets the rope and is going to hold the helicopter as it falls, uh, and you can kind of see in and I think Morpheus even says it. He says he's beginning to believe, and uh, you know Trinity grabs the the rope shoots the thing and he saves her 
And I then, thought this was a great scene. And what then a kick ass rescue. And then they could get out of the matrix. And of course, Morpheus gets out, Trinity gets out, but just before uh Agent Smith shoots it out of Trinity's hand, doesn't she? As she's getting Yes. Because I think the receiver gets blown up as Yes. The, yeah. the, the homeless person. Mm-hmm. Right. And so uh, on the Nebuchadnezzar, everyone's saying, run, Neil, run. And he turns around and he's going to stand up. So he made a choice. He chose to be the one. And this is. But he's not the one yet. Uh, he's pretty close. I this, mean, he's on this, the verge. This he's on it. the verge. He I'll need, explain it, why it he's on, not in a little bit. Well, just explain it now. Because it's not until he fulfills the Oracle's prophecy. The Oracle said, for one of them to live, one of them had to die. He dies when Agent Smith shoots him. Then he gets resurrected by the Trinity, who brings him back. That's when he officially becomes the one. Because now he's seeing everything in code. He's got these extra abilities. And he believes that he's basically more powerful than death. He can overcome death. That's when officially he is fully the one. I'll buy that. I agree. I'll buy that for But I think at this point, I think you're absolutely right. He is on the verge of becoming the one right he's he's getting the the combat down and the skills yeah, he he, he's he's beginning to master what he can do inside the matrix mm-hmm. he's then he has a little square off with agent smith one of many that we will come to see in those god awful sequels but uh, that is a great looking fight in the subway it is and it's very reminiscent of a western you know, you have the paper blowing mm-hmm. by and the slow motion and uh, it was shot very well and, you know, with the greenish tint. Cause that was the, the scene I think Hugo Weaving got pretty badly injured. Yeah, I think it was too. When the stuntman threw him up into the ceiling. Oh, yeah. And he apparently had to have surgery, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. I, did, I wouldn't doubt it. Uh, Keanu Reeves broke his ankle or did something where yeah. he couldn't because he doesn't do a lot of kicks. Yeah. He had he knows, have major back surgery. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Neo, they run. So Neo's looking for an exit, and he calls the operator, and he gives them the location. Did you guys realize that that was the same building from the very beginning? I didn't realize it at first, but it's not only the same building. The, the where he gets shot, where he gets shot going into the room. Mm-hmm. That's the same room that Trinity was in in the very beginning of the movie. Correct. What, what room the same number? Three hundred one, I believe. No, three hundred three. Three hundred three. I was close. Yeah, yeah. So that's and that's why Agent Smith knows, and yeah. that's why he's there. Neo's apartment's 101. Mm-hmm. That's right, 101. Yeah. And so he, uh, Neo opens the door to the apartment, he answers the phone, and Agent Smith there, and we get some gunshots, and Neo gets shot. We think that uh, he's dead. And you all know he's the, not dead. And all the while, in the real world, the Sentinels, the little squid things, uh, f- have found the Nebuchadnezzar, and they're starting to attack. Mm-hmm. Did you notice that Neo's blood wipe on the wall there? That's the most blood that we see in the movie. There is very little blood when people die in this movie. Well, yeah, because there's too much concrete falling around them. They hit everything but the fucking bodies. So, yeah, he gets shot. And then we cut back to the Nebuchadnezzar. The tension is building. And, you know. Well, let me ask you this. This is the big scene where Trinity gets on top of him and says, you can't be dead. This is the reason because Oracle said I would fall in love with the one and and I'm in love with you. Did you feel the spark between these two? Did you feel like they were a good, they had good chemistry? Yep, ever since they met in the nightclub. You felt the that? way she leans into him and whispers to him, and just their whole, um, their whole interaction. Mm-hmm. Uh, I bought it. What about you, Ken? Yeah, Bye. yeah. Not not to have Ken jump over the table at me. I know you like Carrie Ann Moss. I kind of felt like she looked like his mother. Uh, that's, I felt like she looked a lot older than him. That's weird, dude. I know. And so that's why it kind of weird. I never really but got you know that what's, chemistry. But what's kind of funny is she probably is a lot older than him. I shouldn't yeah. say a lot, but she, she probably is older than I him. I think she did Kate, fantastic in the role. I just didn't buy the chemistry between the two of them. I never did, even in the sequels. Yeah, when, and you never bought the chemistry in uh, the Batman films either. So I'm curious, do you believe in chemistry? I'm a hater. <laughs> you are a hater. <laughs> Um, so yeah, we come to the point where Trinity gives him the kiss of life. I like to think. I like the great line right there of now get your ass up or get, something like that. Well, she knows she says now get up. Mm-hmm. Um, I like to think that love conquers all. And that's kind of where it, it, it came into. Um, and that's fine. And that's why you had a heart attack, dude, because you have no heart. I had to have something to stop. <laughs> That's why I'm so uncaring and unfeeling now. Oh, I see. I see. 
Uh, lucky us and everyone you uh, have contact with. He comes back to life. He can now see the code and he is now the one. And there's a great callback. Uh, Morpheus tells Neo during his training or Morpheus or Neo asks, will I be able to dodge bullets? And Morpheus says, when the time's right, you won't have to. And so, and this is the callback and they all fire his guns and he stops them in mid mid air. And with the, the best line in the movie, no, he turns them and they all just drop. And then he dispatches of them pretty quickly. And I like how, what he did to Smith. I like how he went inside the program and then blew him out from the outside. Even before that though, inside, I actually really liked this fight scene where all of a sudden, you know, before he was having troubles fighting Smith, now that he can see the code and see kind of what moves agent Smith's going to do, he can just fight him with one hand. Yeah. And I thought that was very clever the way they did that. Yeah. And, but because we've seen that every other fight in the sequels for the rest of the movies, they don't make any sense. I will explain why they make sense. They don't make any sense. Do you want to know why they make sense? Yeah, throw it at me real quick. Because when Neo goes through Agent Smith, goes into him, mm-hmm. basically, mm-hmm. he left a part of himself in it. That's what it says in the script. That, that He left a bit of his own Matrix programming in him and allowed Smith to not have to follow the rules anymore. And because he didn't follow the rules, his code was different. He became a virus. Neo could no longer anticipate his moves. That's how they wrote it in the script. No. That's how they explain it. That's not how they set it up. They set it up with him being the one and stopping Agent Smith. And I'm not just talking about Agent Smith. Mm -hmm. Okay, I get that. I get that he imprints on him, blah, 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 blah. All the others, I agree with you. Agent Smith, he... he, Well, he... Well, yeah. (laughs) The, The... the sequels are, are like two podcasts on their own. But, uh, then but again, anyways, okay. they, they set up him to be this complete badass, but it does not carry over to the other films. And I think that's one of their biggest problems. Well, again, I know how much you love the sequels. The people that he struggles with, you notice, aren't following the rules anymore. They are not part of the machine anymore. They example, there's the scenes where he fights the people who like the, the two twins or the ghost twins. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They are. I don't think he ever fights them. He, well, I'm just saying the characters like that. He is. Those are remnants of past matrixes. Yeah. Of mm. instances, they for some reason maybe he just cannot anticipate their code like he could when Agent Smith was plugged in. Mm. He can anticipate the code of anything plugged in. That's so stretch. the other agents he has no problem with. It's the ones that are no longer plugged in, like those ones that are become the werewolves and the right, vampires. But the or, fact that he even has to fight them yeah. is dumb. He's stopping bullets with just thinking about it. He still stops the bullets in the future movie. Well, I get that, but if he can stop the bullets, why can't he just think of them blowing up? But he also thinks... Uh, why can't he just delete them? Maybe he's having fun. Mm, I think it's a problem. Okay. But anyways. So yeah, we now know that Neo's the one. He gets out of the Matrix alive, and then we cut to you know uh, the ending scene. Which um, p- puts us right back to how the movie started. Right. A phone call. Later, Neo makes a telephone call inside the Matrix, promising the machines that he will show their prisoners a world where anything is possible. He hangs up and flies into the sky. A la Superman. And he makes a promise to the machines that he can't keep. But, you know, whatever. That's why I think this film could have been a standalone. If you ended it just like that, it would have been great. Now, they, the Wachowski siblings had a deeper story to tell and unfortunately to me there's a lot of plot holes and some of it that just doesn't make sense now whether it was studio interference or just you know at the time who knows but what we got with reloaded and revolutions in my opinion was a garbled mess Mm -hmm. with so many questions that if their job or their goal was to make me ask questions and question everything at the end of it well then they did okay I think the main purpose from what I've read of the sequels was to make you question, again, what I brought up earlier, is there freedom of choice? Do you really, in any world, have the freedom of choice? Because we find out later, uh, Neo is just following a script. He is supposed to do this thing, and he's he's basically uh, acting out the exact same script all the past ones have acted out. Except for that one moment where his choice came in. Exactly. And so that's the one time that maybe he did actually make a choice. But again, 
everything led up to exactly where the Oracle said she wanted it to go, which was the machines and the, the humans living even in just a temporary, but a temporary peace. So really, she got him exactly where he wanted to go. Every choice he made got exactly where she wanted. Yeah, but it was his choice. He could have chose the other door. So, for example, the, she, the architect scene. He chose to go get Trinity. He could have mm-hmm. chose to go back and just end the war yeah, and but, save Zion. But it was the factors placed before him that influenced his choices. So it's, it's the way you look at it. That's what they wanted you to discuss. To be, was there freedom of choice or wasn't there? You're on the side of there was freedom of choice. I'm on the side of... He was led by his nose. Yeah, but you're also on the side of the machines being the heroes. So. No, I didn't say they're heroes. I didn't. I just said they may not be the bad guys. No, okay, well, you are on the side of the machines, which leads me to think that you have no heart or soul. But that's fine. We still love you anyway, John. Okay. Ken, any thoughts of, uh, of any of this? How the movie ended? I wish that they would have just left it as a standalone. I think it is a strong story all by itself. Having the two and three movies follow, it was way too soon. They worked on the Wach- the, Wachowski, the Wachowski brothers. They worked on that script for years. Reloaded, and uh, and, and the third one just they they were rushed. Well, I don't know if they were rushed, but yeah, I, I, the stories were f- inferior. They pale compared to the story of the Matrix. <laughs> They did have about half of the second movie pre-written into their first script. So they planned for Agent Smith to come back, and all of that was originally, and that got cut out of their first script. Of him coming back, but he does come back. But I'm just saying, you don't see that in the first movie. When Neo flies up in the air, that's the end of the movie. The end of the movie was supposed to be uh, setting up for the second movie. They had already planned out the second movies, but they didn't think they were going to get any more movies. Which is why when it ended, it was fine the way it ended. Yeah. Uh, it, in my opinion, it could have been a standalone yeah. film. What you got, like we were saying in the sequels, was a convoluted story, horrible special effects, and especially from the guys who invented it. Well, what we could but it do was all bad. is discuss more about the sequels when you guys draw from the, the helmet. You, How many movies do you have left? I think I have one movie left. I mean, we have not done four of your films, have we? I think Flash so. Gordon, Dark Knight, Matrix. Three. Oh, so I guess we have only done three of mine. Oh, great. So, so now Matrix next is three. What if we get Revolutions first and not reload it? Uh-huh. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> I got plenty to say. Oh, I'm sure you do. And it's all horse shit. Um, all right. I think we are getting ready to rate uh, the Matrix. Uh, the way we do our rating is a one through five. And we kind of base that on if the movie was on TV, would we stop and watch it? How long would we watch it for? Or would we pass it by? Uh, all together john since you had a heart attack and you are needing your rest ken will go first well i think that it is pretty clear what i think of the movie i love this movie it is probably one of my top 10 favorites it blew me away when i saw it i, I love the action sequences executed so well i i, I love the driving music in some of the scenes you know like like uh when Neo and Morpheus are in the uh, training and they're and they're doing their kung fu stuff, oh, the, the music is just so driving. I, I I just dig it, and I I have to give it a five. Uh, I think that uh, when Neo and Morpheus are in the construct and they see the woman in red, <clears throat> that song, that song's dope. So if you go back and watch it, that's such a great beat. And the soundtrack alone for this film was really good. A very specific genre. Did you catch that they went up an octave every time they did a sequel? The same intro, but just up an octave. Yeah. I thought that was clever. Yeah. So is this your first five, Ken? No. What What other movie did you get five to? Uh, Goodfellas. Goodfellas. Road Warrior. Okay. Wow, he's just (laughs) generous with those fives. All right, I'll go next, as I think that John needs to catch his breath a little bit. I don't want him to push it too hard. Uh, Left arm, dude. Left arm. Uh, I would give The Matrix... Okay, so it came out in 99, and it was revolutionary, and it won a bunch of awards, and, uh, you know, it's a fun watch. Uh, I'm glad I sat down and watched it. Uh, It made me think of how much I really disliked the sequels, and that I'm disappointed that it wasn't a standalone film. But, you know, 
if the matrix was on tv uh, i might stop 10 seconds 30 seconds it didn't i mean it's like every other action film out there i get the symbolism and i get what the Wachowskis were saying and the story is coherent and there's a beginning a middle and an end and the action was fun at the time and the effects were good at the time but because it's been copied so much and effects have gotten so much better in today's day and age i think there's a lot of things i would watch before it so i am going to give the matrix a three wow a 3.0 so i guess my review's next do you uh, think i'm it, capable it, of if, you, it if you're feeling up to it you tell me john I, I think i can can manage through this okay uh matrix is one of those movies that i love talking about and again goes back to me storytelling uh the comic book feel the symbolism just there's so much in it and it's one of those movies that I can watch over and over again and again catch a different element or come up with a different argument. You know, again, who's the good guys? Who's the bad guys? You know, the chemistry, the what did they do wrong? And just so many things that I love about this movie and could just talk about it forever. This podcast could go on for three, four hours at this point. Uh, no, it couldn't. And well, of course you wouldn't let it, but I could talk for three or four hours about this movie, how much I like this movie. And what we were just saying, Ken, a second ago about this movie or a different movie, which one I watch, it's always this movie. Flash I, Gordon or The Matrix. It's going to be Matrix. Okay. Unless I'm with my friend Nate, and then it's going to be Flash Gordon. Well, you had said that whenever it's on, you call him. Yeah, so, Flash Gordon. Right. So, But if Matrix is on the same time, I might not call Nate. Ooh, so, Nate, if you're listening, wow. But anyway... I am going to agree with Ken. I'm going to give this movie a 5.0. Oh, well, I'm sure. In my you, first five. I'm sure you would. And I expected nothing less from both of you because when we picked it, Ken got all kinds of excited. And I mean, you put it in the helmet for a reason. So I would good define, on you. I would define Ken's reaction as giddy. Yes, absolutely. And coming in tonight, he was very gushy. Mm -hmm. yeah. it's, it's, it's fun to see Ken that excited. <laughs> Um, okay, so now I think we have come to the point of where we're going to pick our next film. And uh, to do so, we are going to draw it out of the helmet. How did we get the movies in the helmet? What was the point behind that? Uh, each of us picked five movies. And didn't necessarily have to be our favorite movies. It was just five movies that we thought of. And we wrote them down and put them into a Bronco helmet. And every week at the end of the podcast we select a new film uh we each put in five my all my five have been uh viewed four of ken's right four or three four of ken's have been reviewed and now three of john's so that leaves us three films left um whose turn is it i'm gonna say it's yours because you didn't die on us oh i like that thanks for not dying yeah i uh we we appreciate you not dying uh, because then we would have had to find a replacement, and that would have sucked. Would it have? <laughs> well, it depends. If you pull the Matrix Reloaded, I'm going to be fucking pissed. Oh, I've been waiting for this one. Hold on, i got to pull up some info. Wait, what the fuck is going on here? We will be watching a movie that is not only a remake, but a sequel at the same time. From one of it, I don't know if this is one of your favorite directors, Sam Raimi. Oh, you got Army of Darkness? We were not, we're not watching Army of Darkness. We are watching 1987's Evil Dead 2 starring Bruce Campbell. Would you consider this a horror film? It is what's called a cult horror slash gore film. But it's also got comedic elements in it. Yep. And again, just to kind of give a little brief... This is meant to be a campy movie. It's meant to be a almost anti-hero film that is just enjoyable. It's a descent into madness. It's a don't read from the book. It's just, it's a great, it's a movie that almost has ties to so many other movies. You can see elements that have been taken from this movie and put into other movies. Oh, yeah. This was also one of Sam Remy's first movies uh kind of got him started he started with evil dead it was one of the first movies that they couldn't give a rating to they wanted to give it an x rating and so it went out with no rating 
Well, he wanted to do a direct sequel, but so many people had not been able to see the first one that he had to remake it into the second movie and then go into his sequel. Interesting. So, it, Have you ever seen it? No. Have you ever seen Evil Dead? No. Have you seen The Army of Darkness? No. Have you seen Ash vs. Evil Dead? No. Army of wow. Darkness is very different oh, I than know. Evil Dead. E- Army of Darkness is more comedic, more sci-fi. This movie does have a lot of horror elements into it, but... From I know I, I've seen it, <laughs> and and Don, you know what I, I think. When every time I see this movie, I think of you actually because this seems like a movie like you would make because the elements of the special effects and all that are not that hard to do, not hard to figure out what they did, but I feel like they did them well. So it should be an interesting movie. Yeah, I'm excited. Uh, I haven't watched a horror film in a long time, and um, I'm kind of missing the horror genre. And Bruce sure. Campbell, oh, he, oh, National Treasure, he is. Right, he's a good dude. Yeah, he's funny. Have he's you funny. seen any Bruce Campbell films? No. So that is not true. You've seen Spider Man. I was just oh. going to say, as soon as you he appeared, <laughs> as soon as you said that's not true, it's like, oh, got it. Yeah. But he has so many, especially in Army of Darkness. But he has so many one-liners and things that have just called back. Yeah. So yeah, I'm excited. I Maybe have a whole section of my uh, collection of movie props and elements that I have that is dedicated to this movie. Yeah. That's awesome. I'm excited. I can't wait. Mm-hmm. I can't wait. All right. So that's going to do it for us this evening. Uh, John, where can they find us? They can find us at www.3guysandaflick.com. And do we have a Facebook page? We do have a Facebook page. Uh, it's also 3 com. We have a Twitter page. We are on Spotify. We are on iHeartRadio. We are on iTunes. Basically, anywhere you can find a podcast, I think you can find us. So to our three listeners we have out there, um, go out to Facebook or Twitter and give us an idea of what you would like to see us review. We'll take a look at it, and maybe it will be the good, the bad, or the absurd. Or yet to get an absurd movie. Next week is going to be absurd. I think. Well, I think there's a little bit of that, too, but we'll get there. Yeah. All right. Uh, so that'll do it for this evening. I'm Don. I'm John. And I'm Ken. And we will see you next time. Thanks for listening.